And so we're getting kind of toward the end here. We're starting to look at some materials that are still relatively common, but um, not as common. And so we're getting into first the nitric oxide. Um, so these are any compounds that contain nitrogen and oxygen. So we kind of put them in this kind of box. There are lots of different versions of nitrogen oxide um, in a variety of different forms. We just generally refer to them broadly because there are a number of different options there. Um, as far as that goes. So, you know, we start with nitric oxide, nitric oxide, um, NO, it is a colorless, odorless gas. Um, it is somewhat flammable as a gas. Um, the far more common form of a nitrogen oxide is actually the nitrogen dioxide, NO2. This is a dark brown gas. It has a very pungent kind of odor to it. It is the primary component that gives smog its brownish kind of color. So if you've looked at photos of certain kinds of industrial cities, Pittsburgh, um, Detroit, from like the 1970s, the 1960s, that brown kind of haze that come, came out of those industrial cities before some of the work of the EPA really kind of started to make a difference in those cities as they went away from that, that particular industry. If you look at heavily populated cities now, places like Los Angeles, pretty much any of the regions of China that make computer parts, you will find smog as a primary component of the air there. You will see a brown cloud around many of those cities, especially during the early parts of the day, before the ozone can kind of come in and break up some of the fog. Um, I'm not sorry, that not the ozone, that the sunlight. When sunlight comes in, breaks up some of the fog, the smog kind of goes away. The, Smog is associated with, you've got fog and pollution kind of mixing together. And that's one of the reasons why it has that kind of plunge in acrid odor. You're, you're getting into a production of a combination of nitrogen, or excuse me, nitric acid and nitrous acid. And that's why it has that kind of strong burning sensation when you inhale it. Now you can see from this diagram, the majority of the NOx gases, that is broadly the, the nitrogen oxide gases that we get, come from two major areas. One of those areas being transportation. Um, this is probably the most common area. Again, we think of it from these, um, kinds of processes where we have heavily populated cities that have uh, a lot of people, a lot of cars, a lot of moving uh, around and NOx gases get put out of that. We also see a big portion of that coming from fuel combustion. And so again, this is kind of, if you think both of them in, in unison, that's 95% of the NOx gases that are produced. And they're both in areas where it's really hard to cut them down. <clears throat> Cutting down fuel consumption is difficult because in most of the sectors that would go about burning these, you kind of need it for electricity or for heating. In the transportation sector, it can be really hard, especially in these days, to convince people that they need to carpool or that they need to take public transportation. Um, and while certain industries are doing better, 
um, you know, the fleet of electric vehicles that have come out, the fleet of buses that have been rolling out over the past 10, 15 years that um, run on natural gas as opposed to um, diesel do cut down on that because methane is a heck of a lot more clean burning than diesel is. But it is still a, a small part of the sector. Most of the transportation um, gases that are formed are formed out of personal automobile usage. These NOx gases do pose a risk of inhalation toxicity. Um, they do also react with the moisture in the air to produce acids, and these acids can cause damage to the respiratory system. Again, I mentioned this before with the smog. When we have nitrogen dioxide reacting with water, we end up getting a combination of nitric acid and nitrous acids. And that potent combination, um, nitric acid is a strong acid, um, hurts a lot, um, has a really pungent kind of odor to it. Nitrous acid is not nearly as pungent, not nearly as strong. But one thing that it does have going for it is that among your weak acids, it's not too terribly weak. Um, it does have some potency to it. And so when you breathe in those gases and they come into contact with the water vapor in the air, they will form acids and they will damage your respiratory system just from sheer corrosive power from those acids. Where we get them for the most part is through the burning of nitrogenous materials, things like ammonia or um, nitrates. Um, but we also can see that in the processes of incomplete combustion, so where the majority of the transportation nitrogen comes from, is actually in the air. If we have a situation where we do not have enough oxygen present, but we've got a hot reservoir. So if we've got a hot engine, but we just can't get enough oxygen, enough air into that engine cylinder to get complete combustion. What will happen a lot of times is that the nitrogen that is also in the air will start fixing itself to the little bits of oxygen that are present and forming these NOx gases. And that's why we can get it as a primary product of that incomplete combustion. That's also why smog tends to form in highly resident or highly populated areas because traffic the greatest there. You tend to have less complete combustion when your engine is idling than when it is going at full speed. Because if you're idling, you're just taking whatever air is around you. And if the other air around you is full of pollutants, it's just going to feed the cycle. Whereas if you're out on the open highway going 75 miles an hour, there's plenty of fresh air around you. You're zipping right through it. And so the chances of running into incomplete combustion when your engine is running at, at full RPM, or at least running well, is much, much lower. Nitric oxide. Um, actually does have some uses to it other than just being a pollutant. In small doses, nitric oxide can be mixed with oxygen and given to respiratory patients. 
the nitric oxide actually um, will reduce some of the inflammation inside of the patient's body, cause the blood, vessel, blood vessels to open up slightly and allow for better flow of blood, allow for better flow of oxygenated blood to go through the system. We also see nitric oxide used in the aerospace industry. Um, nitric oxide is a relatively good oxidizer. And so we will find it used often in those kinds of zones where we can use it to oxidize rocket fuel. So we put it into the um, rocket. It will uh, react with hydrazine usually. And that hydrazine and that nitric oxide will produce a combustion reaction of sorts that produces tons of gas that allows the rocket to be propelled. And so it goes through space um, through that propulsion. Some of the downsides, NOx gases can react with ground level ozone. Ground level ozone is another common contributor of smog. Um, and what happens there is that the NOx gas will actually react with the oxygen on the ground and cause the oxygen to basically become radicalized. So what happens is that um, nitric oxide If we look at its structure, whether it's NO or even NO2, We'll notice that the nitrogen in each one of these molecules does not have an octet. In fact, in each case, in each case, we'll see that there is an unpaired, unshared electron on the nitrogen in each one of those molecules. And as a result of that unpaired and unshared electron, these guys are really reactive. And so what happens is that unpaired, unshared electron starts going out and trying to grab an electron for its pair, for its mate, so that the nitrogen can finish up its octet. So one of the places it does that is with ground level oxygen. And when that happens, that turns oxygen from being a relatively stable element to an element that has an unpaired and unshared electron of its own. And the only way that fixes that is it goes out and grabs another oxygen and makes ozone. Now, ozone has its own set of problems when it's down here. Up high in the atmosphere, ozone's great. Or makes somewhat of a chemical shield that blocks out a lot of the ultraviolet and cosmic energy that comes from the sun. Has kind of a resonant frequency that basically just blocks and reflects and deflects those kinds of light. That's why there was such a big stink about the ozone layer in the 1980s and in the 1990s, because the use of certain types of chemical agents we're causing the same thing that was happening to the oxygen down here to happen to the ozone up there. And the layer started thinning out and we ended up having a hole in the ozone layer that, that was over one of the polar ice caps. Now, through the reduction of use of certain types of materials, uh, in particular, chlorofluorocarbons were the primary culprit there. Um, but through the reduced usage of those, the ozone layer has started to kind of regenerate itself. 
But up in the upper atmosphere, we want ozone. Down here in the lower atmosphere where we live, we don't. Ozone itself has kind of a nasty effect on our bodies. Um, in small doses, it just smells bad. That smell that you get when, um, you know, uh, you have an electrical short. You plug something in and it, it makes a spark. Um, you use a kind, you use um, certain kinds of electric motors and they start to overheat. That smell that's associated with those objects, that's ozone. And in small quantities, that's all it does is it just smells bad. In large quantities, it can actually really hurt your lungs. And that's what this line really is getting into. Large scale um, ozone ir will cause irritation to your mucous membrane, and that can affect your eyes, that can affect your throat, your nose, your lungs, basically your entire respiratory system. In high doses, it's not so great. In low doses, it doesn't really do much more than just smell that. Nitric oxide and nitrogen are easily absorbed into your blood. They will react with your hemoglobin to form something called methemoglobin. And as we talked about with carboxyhemoglobin, with carbon monoxide, one of the dangers of methemoglobin is that it does attach stronger to the hemoglobin than your oxygen does. Remember, oxygen just is in a give and take relationship with your hemoglobin. It attaches, the hemoglobin takes it where it wants to go, it detaches. The attachment and the detachment don't require a whole lot of energy. Whereas with carbon monoxide and with nitric oxide, once those molecules attach, the bonds that they make to that iron in the hemoglobin are pretty strong. So it doesn't detach very easily. And so the greater the exposure is, the more that it just travels around the bloodstream and does not detach. And the more likely it is that you'll run into some symptoms associated with um, either anoxia or literally asphyxiation. It is a product of complete and incomplete combustion uh, where we see it the most often um, if we have nitrogenous materials. So um, probably the biggest culprit are any kind of polyurethane based substances. Um, and where we see those most often are in foams. So foam cushions. Um, the padding in your couch, the um, what makes your car seat so nice and comfortable that you can drive for seemingly forever. That's polyurethane foam. And when those kinds of things burn, they do burn and release nitrogen, which can turn into nitric oxide. Another nitrogen-based pollutant and toxic potential gas is ammonia. Now, ammonia is a colorless gas, but it is quite pungent. Formula for ammonia, NH3. This is not our first introduction to ammonia in this class. We've talked about it primarily as a fertilizing agent, um, used often by farmers and others in the agriculture industry as a nitrogen fixer. Um, to provide nitrogen to the plants that it is trying to grow. We can also see anhydrous ammonia used as a coolant, a cooling agent in large refrigeration systems. We've talked about anhydrous ammonia in small quantities, not necessarily as a cryogen, 
but the fact that it can be kept very, very cold is of particular use for this kind of application. So the anhydrous ammonia gets pumped in, it acts as a heat sink, takes the warm air from the refrigerator, gets pumped out, releases that heat to an external source, cycle repeats itself. That's more or less how refrigerators work in general. As we talked about in our unit on flammable gases, ammonia is flammable, although it is not characterized as a flammable gas. It meets neither of the criteria for flammable, um, flammable gas uh, distinguishment based on the DOT standards. Remember the DOT standards say that you have to have a lower range of 13 or less, or uh, you have to have a lower explosion limit of 13 or less, or an overall range of 12% or greater. This meets neither of those criteria, so it is not classified as a flammable gas. But we do know that in that range, it will ignite. Where we see it generated in fire scenes comes in mostly two different ways. First of all, there's lots of nitrogen in animal products. Um, so whether they come from, um, they're naturally occurring, or if we have things that are derived from animal products, things like, um, um, uh, cowhide or, um, leather goods, um, some of those other commercial products that we get from, from agriculture um certainly things like urea um, which can be found in um, animal byproducts can turn into ammonia um, at a fire scene and fertilizer fertilizers usually contain nitrogen in the form of ammonium um, nitrate or ammonium um, um, other ammonium products um, and the ammonia nh4 plus will decompose into ammonia when exposed to heat. So we can get ammonia that way as well. When it comes to firefighting, we tend to um, establish a water curtain downwind um, that helps to trap the ammonia gas, put it into a basic solution, um, which will effectively nullify its flammability. Um, because once it's in solution, you've got to evaporate the solution in order to release the, the ammonia again. When it comes to things that you can be injured by when it comes to ammonia, um at negative 28 fahrenheit again very very cold not quite cryogenic uh, but anhydrous ammonia does have the ability to cause almost instantaneous frostbite freezing your skin and your tissues um when you breathe in strong amounts of ammonia vapor you can begin to experience ill effects from that give her go to a place where they are doing a deep disinfecting of the floor or of the bathroom or of wherever. That strong ammonia smell that kind of knocks you back. If it's too high of a concentration, it can make you feel a little dizzy or give you some other kinds of ill effects that come as a result of that interaction. That's where you have to be careful. That's where the people that are doing the cleaning have to be careful as well. Again, primary ways that we get hurt by ammonia through its temperature, anhydrous ammonia, again, near a cryogenic, not actually cryogenic. Uh, so we can get flash freezing, we can get frostbite from accidental exposure 
and the vapor itself um, doesn't smell good to begin with. And if you smell too much of it, you can, it can have some effects on your body. This is where most of us encounter anhydrous ammonia. Um, if you have worked on a farm or worked near a farm, you've seen these nurse tanks around. If you've never seen one of them, go down Route 41 and about uh, six, seven miles outside of town, you'll see about 50 of them being sold um, at one of the um, farm supply stores uh, along the highway there. They're very common. And they're all, they look all exactly like this. They're on a cart, pink is painted bright white. It's got green letters all over it to indicate that it is non-flammable. And in this case, anhydrous. Um, and it'll say so right on there, that that's what it is. All right, let's switch gears. So thus far, we've been talking mostly about toxic materials, things that will have a negative impact on your body. And usually that impact is felt pretty close to either immediately or within a relatively short amount of time of exposure. We're moving now into talking about carcinogens, which have a much more long-term kind of an effect. And so because these usually kind of go into either the chronic effect or the latent effect zone of exposure, we tend to describe their reactions to our body in terms of stages. And so there is a stage of development that needs to be explored here. And the first part of the initial exposure our stages of development for a carcinogen is called the initiation stage. In the initiation stage, whatever it is that we encounter that is a carcinogen, the first thing that it does is it will impact and affect and our affect. genetic material. So whatever it is works its way into our DNA alters the genetic code in some kind of way. And that's where it stops. That's where that first stage goes. Now, from this first stage, one of two things happen. Either the genetic code gets permanently damaged and the cell just dies. Those kinds of point mutations that lead to cell death are common or the genetic code gets damaged enough that it's no longer working properly, but not so damaged that it just dies, it ends up replicating. And if, rep if it starts replicating, then we get into the second stage, the promotion stage. In the promotion stage, that damaged cell starts to divide, starts to replicate itself starts to make copies of itself. Just like all cells do. Every cell in your body goes through some kind of a replication phase. Otherwise, you would die. Because at some point, your cells just wear out. So the replication isn't the problem. It's the replication of this damaged genetic code that is the problem. <laughs> And if we get enough of those damaged cells that are all replicating, what they will start to do is they'll start to aggregate. They'll start to kind of clump together and they'll form polyps. These bundles of tissue that are grouped together in areas around this damaged zone. Now polyps themselves are not necessarily bad, it depends on what the mutation is. But one of the things that polyps can do is once that genetic code is damaged and does not work the way that it should, it, it leaves the door open for further mutations to take place. Because once we damage the DNA and the DNA is kind of irreparable, it becomes a lot easier to manipulate more in that DNA code. And if we continue to be exposed to the carcinogens, 
if you continue to add to that problem. And sometimes these genetic mutations ultimately turn these polyps, which can be benign, not necessarily harmful, although intrusive, into tumors, uh, malignant ones at that. And once we go from being benign to malignant, then we've got a real problem. Because a malignant tumor usually leads to those other kinds of forms where we start talking about, okay, what do we need to do about this? Does it start going after other body systems? Does it start attacking organs? Does it start, um, it goes from just being a lump of cells to a dangerous lump of cells that can potentially cause other lumps of cells in other parts of your body. When it comes to carcinogens, there are three primary groups of carcinogenic material. The first group are the known human carcinogens. These are the substances that through a series of study and a significant chunk of time, we have been able to identify them as potential suspects and then verify the results over time. So these carcinogens are well known to us. There's not a whole lot of debate about them. The second category, the second group are the probable human carcinogens. These are ones that have been identified and <coughs> We know something of them, but there's just not enough evidence yet to support them being recognized as fully known human carcinogens. That's kind of the middle category. The third group are the possible human carcinogens. These are ones that we've identified as potentially being carcinogenic. There is a potential link between them and the causing of cancer in certain types of patients. But those findings are very preliminary and most of the evidence is largely anecdotal. Meaning there haven't been large scale trials. There haven't been really much of anything other than some beginning stages of linkages. Now, over time, as evidence starts to funnel into one class or the other, we will see possible carcinogens turn into probables. We will see probables turn into known. And we really don't ever see it go the other way. As you might guess, that last list, the ones that are possible carcinogens, that is the largest list. Because again, we don't need a whole lot of linkage to put the possibles out there. We just say, okay, we think there might be something out here. It needs further investigation. Maybe we put some warning labels on things that identify that this substance might be linked to cancer. And then we let the evidence roll in over time. The way that we get exposed to carcinogens can come in one of two varieties. The first is through consumer products. For those that have ties to being to carcinogenic agents, the, they are required to put a notice on the material itself. <clears throat> you may have seen these notices before, California Prop 95 notices that are on pretty much any electronic device um, come to mind as one particular example. <clears throat> 
Now, the thing with California Prop 95 is that Prop 95 covers anything that is a possible carcinogen. And so as a result, that warning label gets put on a lot of things. Um, and probably, probably goes too far in terms of doesn't actually tell you what the, the substance is that is causing it or why, how you could be exposed to it. It just tells you that this product contains a substance that has been identified and linked to cancer. That's really kind of all it says. Exposure can also come in another variety, and that's at work. If the potential exists that you are exposed to a carcinogenic material when at work, it is your employer's responsibility to provide you with information and the proper protections for the exposure to that substance. All right, another group of substances that tend to have a little bit of, um, or of uh, a long-term effect in terms of their toxicity are metallic compounds. Now, most metals are something that you need trace amounts of in your body at all times in order to do the normal kinds of functions of your body. You need small amounts of copper. You need decent amounts of iron. Um, you need varying amounts of, you know, all the different minerals out there, all the different vitamins. And, and most multivitamin kinds of companies kind of harp on that particular fact and try and get you to buy those products. You need small amounts of all of those things to just to help you maintain normal function. However, if you've ever heard the term, it's not the substance, it's the dose, when, re when referring to the toxicity of certain things, that is especially true for metals. A small amount of copper is good for you. A large amount of copper can kill you. Now, some materials are more lethal than others. In particular, when it comes to mercury and lead, really there's no truly safe amount of either of those. Yes, you might ingest small amounts of either one by accident, just from airborne substances, for example, and they probably won't do you any harm. But a prolonged, subs uh, prolonged exposure to a large quantity can actually be pretty dangerous. So depending upon the conditions, we can see that some kinds of metals are going to be toxic, some are going to be beneficial, and some, it really depends on how much you have, whether they're toxic or beneficial at all. Of the ones that are toxic, lead is probably the most common. Lead poisoning is a... I won't say a common attribute, but there are far more products out there that contain lead than contain mercury or other kinds of toxic metal. Now, where do we find lead the most often? Paint. Especially if you have a house that was built um, in the era where we had lead paint, so going up into the 70s and 80s, Lead paint is a possibility, it is a problem. Um, and it's possibility and problem is not just from kids, you know, being naturally curious and chewing on windowsills and ingesting um, lead paint through those means. Lead paint also flakes off just like any other paint does. Little bits of shavings fall onto the ground, 
children can eat them because they don't know what they are because you don't have any real exposure to kids in your life kids eat everything they put everything in their mouth um but even in other cases things like doing a renovation and you're sandblasting or you're sanding down things and you're taking the, the paint off the walls smoke dust those can be inhaled ingested accidentally and increase your exposure to lead probably the most common damage that comes as a result of lead toxicity is that it affects your central nervous system. It is theorized, theorized, not necessarily proven, but theorized that one of the downfalls, one of the reasons that Rome fell was through the use of lead-based pigments in their clay pots. And over time, um, it is theorized that Nero, um, the man who famously played his fiddle as Rome burned to the ground, um, his craziness may not have just been a factor of insanity in the psychological sense, but from an induced lead poisoning coming from the exposure of lead in terms of some of the objects that he ate and drank off of. And so the damage to his central nervous system from that prolonged lead exposure over time, it wasn't a big dose of lead that got him necessarily. The fact that he was exposed to it continuously ultimately made a difference. Other forms of lead that are potential carcinogens, lead acetate and lead phosphate. There are a number of laws in place now that completely ban the use of lead in paint and other surface coated materials. However, um, in our global economy, we have found that just because we have laws against lead based paints in the United States, that doesn't necessarily protect all of our children from lead in those forms. There have been a number of cases of overseas toys products that were painted with lead-based paints and children getting exposure to lead as a result of just putting those toys in their mouth and being, you know, kids. There are also certain furniture articles that have been shown to bear lead-based paints as well. Again, these primarily come from overseas manufacturing where restrictions on such things are not as common. And so that is where I am going to stop for today. On Wednesday, we will talk about asbestos. We will also talk about biological agents, including anthrax and ricin. And that will be where we end this unit and should have a couple of minutes left to at least start the oxidizer unit, which is what's coming up next. Have a great day.